Welcome to Shanama, Book of Kings. Today, we continue with the reign of Yastigard. A man came to Mahai and said, The king of the world is now one with the earth. Byzantine priests and monks have filled the land with mourning for him. Young and old, they were weeping to take this body from the mill pond. They built a great tomb for him in a garden. Evil and shameless Mahai said, Until now, Persia has never been kin to Byzantium. He gave orders that all who had built the tomb or had mourned for the king be killed and the area be plundered. This was Mahai's notion of pleasure and appropriate behavior. Then he looked about him and saw that in all the world there was no remaining descendant of the royal line. This shepherd's son possessed the king's crown and seal ring, and he longed to rule. He called his confidants to him and told him that that was in his heart. He said to his vizier, You are an experienced man, and you must know that a day of battle is looming. I have neither wealth nor name nor lineage to boast of, and I see that my life is at risk. The name on this seal ring is Yastigerd's, and my sword is unable to pacify the people. All of the cities of Iran were his to command, but no wise man calls me king, and my seal's authority is not respected by the army. There were other alternatives to the things I did in secret. Why did I shed the blood of the king of the world? I spent my nights tormented by anxiety, and God knows the state in which I live. His advisor said, The deed is done, and the world is full of talk of it. Look to your own affairs, because you have cut the thread of the warp now. He lies in his tomb beneath the dust, and has the cure for all the poisons that afflicted his soul. Call together men of experience, and speak to them sweetly and plausibly. Say, The king gave me this crown and seal ring as marks of authority. He did this because he knew an army of Turks was approaching. He summoned me in the darkness of the night and said, When the dust of battle rises, who knows who will emerge victorious? Take this crown and seal ring, and it will mean that some day they will be of use to you. This is all I have in the world, and see that you hide them from the Arabs. Follow my precepts in all you do, and do not give my throne to the enemy. I have this crown as an inheritance from the king, and it is at his command that I sit on the throne." In this way, you will put a good face on your deception. Who will know whether this is the truth or a lie? When Mahai heard his words, he says, Wonderful! You are a true vizier. There is none better. He summoned the commanders of his armies, and he spoke to them as the vizier had suggested. They knew that what he said was untrue, and that he deserved to have his head cut off for his impudence. One of the champions there said, this is your business, whether what you say is true or not. Mahai sat on the royal throne and became ruler of Khorasan by this ruse. He gave grants of lands to the nobility and said, By virtue of this seal ring, I am the world's king. He distributed the world's lands while the stars looked on in astonishment. He gave his elder son, Bok, and Herod, and sent armies out in every direction. He promised evil men as might he expected of a scoundrel of his character, making criminals governors everywhere, and wise men had to bow their heads and obey them. On all sides, truth was humiliated and lies flourished. When this wretch had gathered together a large enough army and collected sufficient wealth, his heart rejoiced. He gave cash to his troops and planned to fight against Bizen. He sent soldiers under the command of an experienced warrior named Garcetan as an advanced guard to Amai. His troops marched on Bakara, and he said, I must take Samarkand and Kach by the authority of this seal ring and crown, and by the command of Yastiker, the world's king, the lord of the seven spheres, I shall be revenged upon Bizen, since it was he who has brought misfortune on Iran. News reached Bizen that Mahai had seized the imperial throne, sent orders far and wide, sealed with the royal insignia, and subdued the countryside. Now he was heading towards the Oxus with an army eager for battle. Bizen took his 
head in his hands at the turn of events, and then he summoned his troops to prepare for war. Information came that Mahai's army had taken Samarkand. They were crossing the oxus and boats, and the dust sent up by their troops hid the sun. Bizen led his men out and prepared for battle. When Mahai saw his opponent's ranks, their armors, helmet, and golden shields, their lances and maces, and chach axes, axes, his soul seemed to desert his body. Sick at heart, he drew up his troops. The air was obscured with dust, and the earth was invisible beneath the mass of combatants. When battle was joined, Bizen planned to close in on Mahai, but Mahai realized this, and wailing in fear, he fled from the center of his army. Bizen ordered his ally, Barson, to lead men to the flank to cut him off. He said, Mahai is afraid of battle. Don't take your eyes off of him. He mustn't be allowed to get back to the Oxus. Barsam watched Mahai's banner, frowning and cursing. He led his men in pursuit of him as far as the sands of the river far. Then he caught up with a fugitive and urged his horses forward. When they were face to face, instead of striking at him with his sword, Barsan reached out and caught Mahai by the belt and threw him easily to the ground. Then he dismounted, tied Mahai's arms, and flung him over his horse in front of the saddle. His companions arrived at this moment, and the whole plain was filled with talk of this exploit. They told him, don't bother taking him prisoner. You should just cut off his head with your axe. Barsam answered, this is not the way to act, because Bizen doesn't know how I've captured him. Immediately, Bizen was informed that this vile slave, this ambitious traitor, this regicide Mahai had been taken prisoner. Overjoyed to hear this, he exulted in his victory and banished care from his mind. A canopy was set up on the soft sand, and Mahai was quickly brought there. With this sinner, saw Bizen, good sense deserted him. He became senseless with fear and began to scatter sand over his head. Bizen addressed him. You low-born wretch, may no subject ever again act as you have done. Why did you kill our just king, the lord of victory and the throne? From father to son he inherited kingship, and was a king himself, the living emblem of Nush and Ravan. Mahai said, From an evil person you should expect nothing but murder and sedition. Cut off my head for the wicked deed I have done, and fling it before this assembly. He was afraid that he would be flayed alive, and that his body would be dragged along, weltering in its blood. Bizen knew his secret terror, and he paused a while before answering. Then he said, I want to cleanse my heart of hatred for you. With this chivalry of you, this knowledge and understanding and character, you coveted the crown and throne. He cut off Mahai's hands with his sword and said, These hands no, have no equal in crime. Then he cut off his feet so that he couldn't move from the spot. Finally, he gave orders that Mahai's ears and nose be cut off, that he be seated on a horse and left wandering the hot sands till he died of shame. He had a herald go about the camp and announce at each tent, May those slaves who would kill their king think better of their foolishness. May those who wouldn't give their lives for the king be as Mahai is, and may they never, ever know glory. Mahai had three sons with his army, each with his own crown and throne. There and then a fire was lit, and the father and his three sons were burned in it. None of his family survived. Or if they did, anyone who met them drove them away. When the nobility curse this family forever and hate them for their murder of the king. After this came the era of Omar. And when he brought the new faith, the pulpit replaced the throne. After sixty-five years had passed over my head, I toiled over more diligently and with greater difficulty at my task. I searched out the history of the kings, but my star was a laggard one. Nobles and great men wrote down what I 
had written without paying me. I watched them from a distance, as if I were a hired servant of theirs. I had nothing from them but their congratulations. My gallbladder was ready to burst with their congratulations. Their purses of hoarded coins remained closed, and my bright heart grew weary at their stinginess. But of the renowned men of my district, Ali Dalami helped me, and that honorable man, Hussein Kata never asked for my works for nothing. I received food and clothing, silver and gold from him, and he who gave me the will to continue. I never had to worry about paying taxes and was able to wrap myself in a quilt of comfort. And when I reached the age of 71, the heavens humbled themselves before my verses. Now I have brought the story of Yazdegerd to an end. In the month of Sependormaz, on the day of Ard, and four hundred years have passed since Hazura of the Prophet. I've reached the end of these great histories, and all the land will fill with talk of me. I shall not die. These seeds I've sown will save my name and reputation from the grave, and men of sense and wisdom will proclaim when I have gone my praises and my fame. And here is where we end the story of Shahnameh, the book of the Persian kings. I hope you will return another time for more stories. But until then, my friends, may life be good.